see the title here, you know what you're in for. In today's video, we're going to have a look back at what made The Killing Joke so brilliant, as well as the many different versions of it starring Mark Hamill, Heath Ledger, and Cameron Monaghan. It was a given that 2016's animated adaptation of The Killing Joke would be the definitive joke of film appearance. The Killing Joke novel by Alan Moore is considered a classic, and they got the voice acting talents of Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill back as Batman and the Joker, and Bruce Timm was working on the project, so surely that has to be a masterpiece, right? Well, I guess we were wrong. Dead wrong. I think it's safe to say that we were all a bit taken aback by the lengthy prologue involving Batgirl, which had no natural connection to the Killing Joke story, and in no way matched the writing style of the rest of the film. I think it's safe to say we were all very taken aback by the confusing romance between Batman and Batgirl. I can think of a number of close friends of Bruce Wayne that would not be okay with this. Really, please, DC Comics, everyone working in fiction, stop normalizing horrible friendship and relationship betrayals. The frick is wrong with you. The main villain was kind of a wannabe ladies man greaser going by the name of Paris Franz, which I'm not even going to dignify and it involves a load of obnoxious reminders of Batgirl being a woman and a victim in this feeble attempt to sort of diffuse the controversy that comes to the latter half of the story. And, you know, it just ends up making this irrelevant. I mean, she ends up stepping into other people's arguments, assuming the worst of men around her, and is on the receiving end of a lot of period jokes. It's so strange to think that this story was added for the sake of updating a story for a more feminist world, and yet it's all about her just succumbing to sexual urges with Batman, and full of immensely sexualized shots of her. On top of this, she quits being Batgirl, which kind of renders the whole death of her kind of less than it was before, if you know what I mean. And that's why the film is a meta masterpiece. The first half was a joke, and it killed my interest in the rest of this film. It was literally a killing joke. It just reminds me of that time I was watching Suicide Squad, and I was like, ah, now I get it. We, the audience, are the Suicide Squad. Well, that's just genius. The common point is, skip the first half of the film and then it's just the killing joke. No problems there, right? And truth be told, I can't see any outright problems with it, but that's kind of the best I can say about it. In the best animated movies, including the best animated Batman movies, the filmmaking is a sight to behold. One example is Batman Mask of the Phantasm. You've got the art deco aesthetic of Gotham City, the noir-esque color palettes, with the very strong blacks, as well as the use of silhouettes. You've got this slight grain to it that makes it feel so timeless, and perhaps most importantly that gorgeous score by the late Shirley Walker, who is dearly missed in Batman films today. I know a lot of people swear by Danny Elfman's Batman theme, and don't get me wrong, yeah, it's brilliant, but no artist has captured the epic sense of turmoil, as well as the sense of inspirational yet gothic heroism in the way that Shirley Walker has. And that's the thing with Mask of the Phantasm. It's an amazing story, expertly told through outstanding directing, cinematography, and music. It was also the first feature film to star Kevin Conroy as Batman and Mark Hamill as the Joker, so this film is just perfection across the entirety of the board. Now, be real with me here, guys. After The Killing Joke was released and we all said the same thing, just skip the first half and then it's brilliant, how many of you have actually legitimately revisited this film and skipped the first half in the past year. I certainly haven't. I don't know anyone else that has. There's a reason for it. This whole film just blows chunks. It's entirely reliant on our love for the novel that it's based on, offering up just nothing new. Now, it's okay to kind of offer nothing new when it comes to adapting the book, but there are certain things in this book that could have been adopted that would have brought something new to the genre of the film. For starters, let's look at the art style. This is clearly based on the remastered edition of The Killing Joke, but am I the only one who thinks the psychedelic use of colour in the original print would have made for a far more distinctive film? There's no way they could have pulled off that Paris France Batgirl subplot in this kind of world. It's an art style that's made simply for a Joker story. And that's the thing, it's specific for this story. It doesn't feel pliable, it doesn't feel like you could get it anywhere else. That's why it would be so much more distinctive. This would have seriously also helped to distract from the, how stiff the low budget animation was in this film. The art style that gets used in this film just ends up looking like 
kind of like the art of Brian Bolland, but it's overly clean and clear. It lacks an identity because each shot just serves simply to tell the story, as opposed to actually allowing the audience to truly experience it. The cinematography doesn't convey urgency or emotion or stakes with any use of colour, lighting or contrast. It simply serves as a means to an end, and that is such a dull move for the storytelling of this specific film. Now, the reason the Batgirl story was tacked onto this is because it's believed that the killing joke cannot fill a feature length runtime. However, they literally rush through this story as if they have a gun to their head. There are ways they could have expanded upon this and doubled down. And this is the trouble with directly adapting a source from a comic book. People read at different speeds and paces and interpret moments very differently. It feels like this film just wanted to get those scenes done and dusted out of the way. And that's how this whole film feels. It just feels like it needed to be done, dusted, out of the way. The climactic speech from the Joker at the end of the film, for example. Mark Hamill and Kevin Conroy did their best to carry this film and are the best thing about it, but sadly Mark Hamill doesn't get the chance to really give what should be the performance of his voice acting career because it feels like he's just being hurried along. The Joker's iconic speech is just played in the background while other action happens on screen and Mark Hamill just hurries through his lines like he's being held to a stopwatch and it is so utterly disappointing. Jay Witt 3D made a 3D animated version of the Killing Joke Climax eight years ago with a Mark Howell impersonator, and it ends up being so much better than the original version because it's slower paced, has a great music choice, as well as holding focus on the Joker as opposed to primarily on Batman fighting off goons like in the official version. And while not the highest standard of rendering, it makes use of colours and shadows in a way that the actual film doesn't. This short lasts at just under 3 minutes. The speech in the final film lasts at 1 minute and 30 seconds before diverting into a fist fight between Batman and the Joker. I know which version I prefer. In the amateur short and in the book, when the Joker makes a speech, he's trying his absolute best to appeal to Batman and establish some common ground. In the feature film, he's doing so while beating Batman over the head with a chair. The reason this works so well in the other versions is because after an entire story of the Joker just being an unrelenting force of evil, we are now seeing a vulnerable side to him, which earns the story's ending with Batman and the Joker laughing together. So, yeah. I'd say, sorry, but the Killing Joke adaptation just isn't good. But then I'd follow up, up with, but which one? And I'd mean this one. But to be fair, it's not exactly like we've been robbed of an adaptation of this story. Sure, we've been robbed of what could have been one of the greatest performances with Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill, and we did at least get a really solid one with Heath Ledger. Now, I know what you're all thinking. What? But has nobody noticed that The Dark Knight is actually very similar to The Killing Joke? The idea is that we have two polar opposites and a midway point. In the original Killing Joke, we have Jim Gordon, the idealistic face of Gotham City, a symbol of virtue. We have the Joker, the true manifestation of Gotham City's dark, discontented underworld. And between the two, we have the Batman, who has the moral fibre of Jim Gordon, but the violent instability of the Joker. The idea is that the evil face of Gotham wants to prove that even the most virtuous and noble soul can be corrupted and succumb to the demon of insanity, which is a very disturbing idea. The idea that all it takes is one bad day to drive the sanest man to lunacy, and just as scary yet, the idea that the loved ones can be caught up in the crossfire makes the Joker like a malevolent cancer upon Gotham. For this story, as the Joker destroys Barbara Gordon's life in the process crippling her, so, in The Dark Knight, we have Harvey Dent, the idealistic face of Gotham City and a symbol of virtue. We have the Joker, the true manifestation of Gotham City's dark, discontented underworld. And between the two, we have the Batman, who has the moral fibre of Harvey Dent, but the violent instabilities of the Joker. The idea is that the evil face of Gotham wants to prove that even the most virtuous and noble soul can be corrupted and succumb to the demon of insanity, which is, again, a very disturbing idea. The idea that madness is like gravity and all it takes is one little push. And just as scary yet, the idea that loved ones can be caught in the crossfire and used as leverage makes the Joker like a malevolent cancer upon Gotham for this story, as the Joker kills Rachel, the love of Harvey Dent's life, and makes Harvey feel responsible for it by appealing to Batman's sense of virtue in offering him a choice between an idealistic idol for Gotham and the love of that man's life. The general skeleton of the killing joke is there in its entirety, and the difference is that the Joker actually succeeds in breaking Harvey Dent, and creating Two-Face in the process. 
What separates this from the Killing Joke movie is that Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight actually makes the most of its premise and the ideas of The Killing Joke, and expands upon them with uncompromising filmmaking in a real-world setting to fully drive home the terrifying notion that the Joker could be anyone. It's why this film has resonated with so many and remains adored even today. What we have here is very much a remix of The Killing Joke. Now, over to Gotham, a show all about origin stories, and one of those origins has been the origin of the Joker. So, to reiterate, The Killing Joke, we have two polar opposites in a midway point. In the original Killing Joke, we have Jim Gordon, the idealistic face of Gotham City, a symbol of virtue. We have the Joker, the true manifestation of Gotham City's dark, discontented underworld. And between the two, we have the Batman, who has the moral fiber of Jim Gordon, but the violent instabilities of the Joker. And the idea is that this evil face of Gotham wants to prove that even the most virtuous and noble soul can be corrupted and succumb to the demon of insanity, which is a disturbing idea. The idea that all it takes is one bad day to drive the sanest man to lunacy, and just as scary yet, the idea that loved ones can be caught in the crossfire makes the Joker more like a malevolent cancer upon Gotham, for this story as the Joker destroys Barbara Gordon's life in the process crippling her. Right, so, in Gotham, we have two polar opposites and a midway point. In Gotham, we have Bruce Wayne, the idealistic face of Gotham City, a symbol of virtue. We have Jeremiah Valeska, the true manifestation of Gotham's dark, discontented underworld. And between the two, we have Jim Gordon, who has the moral fibre of Bruce Wayne, but the violent instability of the Joker. The story is that the evil face of Gotham wants to prove that even the most virtuous and noble soul can be corrupted and can succumb to the demon of insanity. But here's where Gotham shakes things up and does things a bit differently. Jeremiah wishes to keep Bruce Wayne on his level as a way of demonstrating his own sanity. As far as Jeremiah is concerned, Bruce is simply wayward and needs to be set straight. Jeremiah feels determined to prove a point and believes himself to be truly beneficial to Bruce Wayne. And caught up in Jeremiah's tirade is Selina Kyle, who he cripples to prove a point to Bruce. What's interesting is that the story in Gotham is doubled up with Jeremiah clinging to the idea of sanity. Jeremiah wishes to bring Bruce to his own level and sees Bruce as an ideal to strive towards, but not for the reason of virtue, but because Jeremiah is fully aware of his own demons from the very start, and those demons have manifested in one Jerome Valeska, the twin brother that Jeremiah manipulated into the absolute face of pure insanity. And what makes this story so profound is that the more Jeremiah tries to run from Jerome, the more he becomes him. And that is the character we'll be seeing in the Gotham finale, when the story finally com comes full circle and the Joker is born. As well as this, Gotham has used specific set pieces from the Killing Joke a number of times. Jerome's Carnival of Torture is a direct homage to the Joker's Carnival of Torture in the Killing Joke, as well as Jerome's mantra of how you can all go insane with just one bad day. As well as this, Jeremiah's origins at Ace Chemical was very much mirror the event that created the Joker in The Killing Joke. And there is, of course, Jeremiah's first transformation, which greatly mirrors the Joker's reveal in The Killing Joke. There is another Joker origin story still to come with Todd Phillips' Joker movie starring Joaquin Phoenix, and while it looks to be more politically fueled, I believe the idea that they're going for is still just a failing comedian taking on a life of crime. And if that ain't similar to the Joker's origins in The Killing Joke, I don't know what is. So, what is your favourite adaptation of The Killing Joke? Comment below and discuss, and as always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, don't forget to hit below to subscribe, hit the like button, and if you've done that already, you truly are a trooper. Thank you so much for watching, and have one bad day.